Next, we're excited to have Kavai Strong Washburn join us. Kavai was born and raised on the Hamakua coast of the Big Island of Hawaii. His work has appeared in Best American Non-Required Reading, McSweeney's, and Electric Literature's Recommended Reading, among other outlets. He was a 2015 Tin House Summer Scholar and a 2015 Bread Loaf Work Study Scholar. He now lives with his wife and daughters in Minneapolis. Too bad he's not living in Kansas City, but it's the second best city in America. Uh, Sharks in the Time of Saviors, his first novel, has been long listed for the Penn Gene Stein Book Award, the Penn Open Book Award, and the Penn Hemingway Award. Kavai, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you with us. Uh, Minneapolis is the best city, but uh, moving on. I wonder if you could start us off by reading from the passage that gives your novel its plot and title. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I guess just a, a quick preface of the this specific section. This is, the story is about a family, and at this stage in their lives, the entire family is living in Hawaii on the Big Island, and they are struggling economically. They've gone through some pretty rough times, and they decide to take a a cruise together, the kind of thing that a lot of tourists would do. They decide to go on a glass bottom boat ride together. And this scene comes in at the tail end of that glass bottom boat ride. Your head was bobbing like a coconut in the ocean. You were getting smaller and farther away and the water was hissing and spanking the boat. I don't remember anyone saying much of anything except the captain calling out from upstairs. Just keep pointing, we're turning. Just keep pointing. Your head went under and the ocean was flat and clean again. There was a song playing from the speakers, a tinny, stupid sweet Hawaiian cover of More Than Words, which I still can't listen to even though I liked it once. The engines churned. The captain was talking from the wheel upstairs, asking Terry to keep pointing. Terry was the one who'd thrown the life preserver that was floating empty in the waves, moving away from where I'd seen your head. I was tired of being told to point, being told to wait, so I said something to Terry. He made a face. Then his mouth was moving under his mustache, words back at me. And the captain was calling again from above. Your father started in too, all four of us saying things. I think I finished talking with something that made Terry start so that his face flushed around his sunglasses. I saw myself in those mirrored lenses, me darker than I thought I was, which I remember made me happy and my shoulders from basketball and that I'd stopped squinting my eyes. Then my feet were up on the railing and Terry's eyebrows were raised and he started to open his mouth at me. He reached for me, I think your father did too but I leapt into the big empty ocean. I hadn't been swimming long when the sharks passed under me. I remember them first as dark blurs that the water told me the weight of those animals, a shove of wake against my legs and belly. They passed me and all four of their fins punched the surface, knives on the summit of dark swells, cutting for you. When they reached where your head had been, the sharks dove under. I started to swim after them, but the distance might as well have been to Japan. I dunked once to try and see. Underwater, there was nothing but a vague darkness and froth where the sharks were, other dark colors, pink and chummy ropes rising from the froth. I knew those would be next. I didn't have any more breath. I broke the surface and choked in oxygen. If there were sounds, if I yelled, if the boat was closer, I don't remember. I went back down. The water where you were was all churn. The shapes of the sharks were thrashing, diving, rising, something like a dance. The next time I went for air, you were at the surface, sideways, prone and ragdolling in the mouth of a shark. But the shark was holding you gently, do you understand? It was holding you like you were made of glass, like you were its child. They brought you straight at me, the shark that was holding you, carrying its head up out of the water like a dog. The faces of those things. I won't lie, I shut my eyes as they neared, when I was sure they were coming for me too. And if everyone was yelling and crying out as I imagined they were, and if I was thinking anything, I don't remember any of that except the black of my closed eyes and my prayers without a mouth. The sharks never hit. They passed again below around me, wake like a strong wind. And then I opened my eyes. You were there at the boat, clutched to a life preserver. Your father reaching down for you. I remember how angry I was at how slow he went all the time in the world. And I wanted to say, are you a Palhana County worker? Grab our child, our alive child. And you were coughing, which meant you were breathing, and there was no red cloud in the water. This wasn't just one of those things. Oh, my son, now we know that none of it was. And this was when I started to believe. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That is one of my favorite passages in the book, which I just enjoyed so much. I want to talk a little bit, though, about um, Hawaii. I did a little Googling. Hawaii's 
uh, according to the sources that I looked at, like there's something like 1.1 million, 400,000 people there roughly. There's, but the demographics are really interesting. 37% Asian, 24% white, 10% native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, 1% black, and 23% are two or more races or list themselves that way, right? And so, yeah. you know, you're a mixed race writer writing about mixed race characters in your, in your novel. And I was thinking about how the Trump election you know, was in a way, I feel like a, re a reaction to the belief that there was this demographic change that was going to put Democrats permanently in power. That was part of the narrative when Trump was getting elected, right? Like, hey, the, the country is going to be much more mixed, right? The country is going to be more mixed. And Hawaii looks like what I think, like much more like what the future of our politics is going to be rather than its past. I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, you know, it's a very specific place to grow up. I'm, I'm grateful that I was born and raised in, in Hawaii because it was a place that inverts that racial dynamic in a way that allowed me to exist as a person without my race ever feeling like it was the, the, primary, the primary determinant of my relationship, not only to just all the parts of the world around me, all the like important institutions, whether that's we're talking again about like schools or police officers or things like that, where every situation you're in, in a lot of parts of the United States, that your race will be the primary determinant of the outcome of your experience of that institution that does not exist in Hawaii, or, or certainly didn't for me. I want to make sure that I don't speak for the entire island or pretend that my experience is, is necessarily indicative of everybody's experience in the islands. But for me, you know, in Honoka'a, where I grew up, uh, those demographics are even, I would say, more skewed. I can I can count on my like one hand the number of of my friends or people that I knew in my class that were like white, just purely white or Caucasian, however you want to refer to refer to it. Almost everybody I knew was two or three races. There were there were a lot of Pacific Islanders and and things like that. And growing up that way, I there was never really any sense of my race being an issue. It was like it wasn't even. I guess it's the way it must feel for for white people in other places. Because for me there, it was just like I was I was part of a of just the culture of the place, you know? And that's such a wonderful feeling. It was such a wonderful gift to receive that. And, and having experienced what I've experienced after that, it's very interesting to realize how important that was in making me somebody that, that thinks very differently about the country and my, my place in it than I would have otherwise. So I think that that would be, it would be a great thing for us to continue to see you know, of, of an increase in the different different racial compositions that could be possible in any part of the country. And I think that's fantastic and it's a good trend, but I think that we also need to not jump to conclusions about what that means politically. Because I think even in, in parts of Texas, you saw very, or in parts of Florida as well, you saw very different outcomes among groups of Latinos, for instance. And yeah. This is just one of many demographics than a lot of people expected, right? A lot of people were like, oh, as these, as these areas become um, more Latino, then we're gonna see an increase in Democrat, uh, you know, democratic representation. And that wasn't the case in, in parts of Texas and parts yeah, well, of Florida. We, we didn't places. say, we left the Latinos out of the, of the, of the headline of this story because we're like, that's too complicated. We'll have to talk about that some <laughs> other time. Um, you know, but yeah. yes, you're right. Obviously the, the, the vote, uh, for their vote in Florida and Texas was was much more for Trump than people would have expected. But then in Arizona, actually, the Latinx vote was was actually really helpful for Biden. So that's a yeah. much more complicated yeah. story. And I think yeah, even exactly. Kamala Harris is like part of this complication in that, you know, right? People are sort of like, oh, a, a black woman, this is very exciting, but she's a prosecutor. And there's sort of a <laughs> lot of conflict and internal discussion sort of within progressive and liberal uh, political conversation there. Do you see her ascension? Kind of, is there but any I mean, chance she's that she's black and South Asian also? Right. I mean, she's mixed race as well. I, I forgot to say that as I should have said. Right. And, and, and I mean, as she's risen in sort of in prominence, it's interesting to, to watch people. Some people realize that there are a lot of families like this. There are a lot of American yeah. families that are mixed race um, in you know, different parts of the family or different races. And that's actually very normal. Do you think mm -hmm. that her being in the limelight like this is going to make people better able to comprehend comple complex identities, better readers of other Americans? Yeah, I, I don't know to the extent we can talk about like better comprehension or better reading, but it certainly makes it more, more visible, right? I think that that's a starting point, right? Whether that leads necessarily to greater comprehension or, or you know, greater understanding of each other. I think that's secondary and I think that requires shared experiences. I think it's very easy to, to see or be around people of different, you know, whether it's a religion or a race or a gender or all the different sorts of identities that, that are part of who we are. 
you can be around people from perspectives different as your different than yours but if you're not interacting then it might not necessarily lead to any real big difference right and so uh the increased visibility is the is really important it's a first it's a big start and i was certainly crying when i got to see i'm probably gonna start crying now <laughs> um when i got to see kamala harris take the oath of office because my daughters were there with me and i was like look do you see this do you see what what is possible like this is the first time this has ever happened right and so every time those things happen um it increases what people believe when you see yourself represented in important positions of power it increases your agency I, I completely believe that and so i think that that's an important outcome of this regardless of whether or not uh people that maybe aren't yet willing to recognize the the true like racial gender and religious just all the different identity groups that represent the united states and are going to increasingly represent the united states you know whether whether her ascending to the position she has changes the perspective of people that are right now threatened or scared or or for whatever reason reject that sort of idea at least for you know at least for those of us for who she represents visually something that is more like ourselves the power that that brings in terms of of recognizing ourselves in power I, I, that that is valuable in and of itself, regardless of whatever you know understanding it might bring. And I hope that that comes, but that only really comes with with sort of shared experiences and things like that. Well, I'd be curious what you both think about this idea. I was thinking about like in terms of how people get better at reading these things or understanding this. Like, I don't think people really thought of Obama as being a mixed race president. He was a black president, but he had white family members who live from Kansas, you know, and that just wasn't as much a part of his red identity as Kamala Harris's mixed race qualities are. I think that's the way it seems like to me. I don't know what it seems like to either of you. Well, I'm Thummel. Um, and certainly among people who are Indian American, I mean, my family is um, Lankan Thummel, but even in that community, sort of like she used a Thummel word in a speech and people sort of erupted in excitement, um, you know, and it was, it's the word for, um, yeah, mother, sister, it's a very specific kinship term. And I was sort of like, wait a second, if I like spoke, um, I mean, I'm, the version of Thummel that I speak is very colloquial. It's, you know, I know the imperative conjugation very well from having been told what to do so repeatedly. And, <laughs> and I was like, she probably had a very similar experience. That's kind of wild. Like I could say those things in front of her and she would understand what I was saying. And so I think, you know, I don't know that white people were easy, eager to seize on Barack Obama as an icon of white representation, but South Asians, um, many folks uh, are, I think, eager to see representation and do see it in her. And she's also engaged with, um, she always mentions her mother, um, as she mentions, you know, um, black women who were influential in her life. Um, and she also always mentions her mother and mentions how her mother um, sought to raise her in the black community. And I think that a lot of us, um, you know, sort of there's a narrative of South Asian communities being very rigid and to see an example of a family that isn't, um, which is also something many of us know in our daily experiences was very satisfying. Um, and yeah, like I loved watching her take the oath, <laughs> like that was delightful. Um, yeah. yeah, it was pretty great. Yeah, I'm guessing that part of it is maybe because, you know, his his mixed race, that a component of it is, as I, as, I, as you've said, is white, right? So he was, he's mixed race, black and white. And I, you know, I don't really like using those color terms. It's not, I never really like it, but it moves a little bit faster. We get to use a shorthand instead of taking the time to break it down into whatever other, you know, I, I use European American, African American sometimes, but for the purposes of shorthanding it, we can just say black and white. You know, I, I think that because the other side of him that wasn't black was white, I think that that's probably part of it. Right. That's why it became less of an issue if he were, as Kamala Harris is, composed of two ethnic groups or ethnic or racial groups that are both still viewed as as minorities or not having the same level of representation, then I think you probably would have seen a celebration of both those parts of him. But I think that the part that was significant that felt particularly powerful was, you know, the black part of him. Well, I celebrate. Uh... Obama's Kansas whiteness, but not enough other people in Kansas do. That's the problem. <laughs> my mom, my mom's, well, she's from Kansas. Yeah, she's from Kansas City, Kansas. My mom's from Kansas City, Kansas. My mom is black and she's from Kansas City, Kansas. So I know that's our Kansas. I'm in Missouri, <laughs> really, but I mean, you know, no, it's I know, right across I know, the I know. state line. See, now we're doing this. I count <laughs> Kansas as a home state, co home state for me. Yeah. Um, all right. So your book is rotating first person point of view, and your characters, the Flores family, are Filipino and native Hawaiian. 
you've identified as African-American and European-American, as you were just saying. Um, can you talk about writing from an identity that's not your own and setting on and setting on that form to tell the story? Yeah, yeah. So I, I get asked this question a lot, which is which is fine. It's not we a talk about this I, question a lot on this podcast. So good, this is a, it's a friendly I, place for that. No, I just I hope that I get better at answering it. Every time I answer, it, I'm like, I hope that I did a better job every time I do it. So, you know, I think that um, so I was born and raised in Hawaii. We've already talked about the ways in which the islands were very powerful for me as part of my identity and gave me the space to be a person in a way that I think I would have experienced totally differently in other parts of the United States. But one of the things that was that was wonderful beyond the fact that I grew around people that were from a variety of backgrounds, typically multiracial, but if they weren't multiracial or from 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 groups that I haven't really encountered in in the same with the same level of of just sort of magnitude as I did there in terms of just everybody I knew was was multiple races or you know if they were one or two races it would be something like Filipino or or Chinese or Japanese or Korean or all the different immigrant groups that have come to Hawaii over the years and so you know those things really informed a lot of my identity because I, I grew up in this community that was that was composed of all these different rich elements and one of those was the native Hawaiian community and in particular you know, the language itself is infused in a lot of the things people talk about. So there are a lot of words from Olelo Hawaii, like the, the native Hawaiian language that are just used in, in just daily discussions. Like they'll show up on like, you know, like municipal signs when people are saying like, throw away your garbage, you know, they'll say something like, please kokua, meaning like, you know, pitch in, help out, be part of making this place better. So these words, those words existed as part of like my just daily lexicon as well. Uh, so there was that, and then there were the elements of actual native Hawaiian culture and history that we studied and that were a big part of my life. Like, you know, I, I danced hula and learned uh, chants and greetings and learned about the history of the, the islands prior to the arrival of, of European explorers and then later on the colonization and annexation by the United States. Like, those were all things that I learned about and became I became a part of that story because I was living in that same space descended from that part of that history, right? So those were all just parts of, of my experience growing up there. And they are part of the confluence of all these different elements we've already talked about, right? Like my mother was very important in, in making me understand and celebrate and value the black part of my life. And, and so was my father, right? But there are also the entire side of his family that's white that I understood and were a part of me that I loved as well. And those things all met, you know, in a confluence of, of these influences from a variety of other cultures with that, that Hawaiian element as a center. So writing this, this novel, I wanted to write from that place and I also wanted it to be a novel that was that was explicitly, or it became the more that I thought about it and the more time I spent working on it, a novel that was explicitly anti-colonial and spoke to the history of the islands in a way that I hope for some readers helps them understand the islands in a way differently than they would. And for me, if I'm going to write about the history of the islands and talk about them from an anti-colonial perspective, then it has to, in my opinion, include at its center the people who are the most important players in that story. And that is, you know, the Kanaka, Kanaka Maoli, Kanaka Oivi. There are multiple terms that people use for Native Hawaiian, um, you know, for, for just to refer to Native Hawaiians, there, there are several different terms. And it would have been wrong if I wanted to speak to that to not have, uh, not have Native Hawaiian people be at the center of that story. And for me, it, there was such a deep resonance with the parallels that I felt from my black lineage and the history of black people in America. And, you know, at one level to me, it felt like a gift being able to grow up in a place where my blackness was never a question. It was never an issue. It was, no, it was like celebrated. It was wonderful to me, you know, it was a part of the something bigger. So I feel so many parallels between the story of native Hawaiians and the story of African-Americans in this country. And, and, and so I think that it, I just wrote from the confluence of all of those different things. You know, uh, something I think of, and I think about it a lot, because uh, I have definitely run into people that are Native Hawaiian that that um, don't hold that same opinion, that feel at some level that what I that me writing from that perspective um, is is not the right thing to do. And, and I think the thing that I come back to, besides everything I've already described, um, in the places where where I feel resonance, is I remember reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. I think back when I was in college, and I remember when he early in the early in that autobiography, he he talks about when he was in, I think he was in a diner. And this was that he had already achieved some level of prominence and a, a, a white woman came into the diner and she said, like, I want to help. I want to be part of this movement. What can I do? And he looked her straight in the face and he said nothing. 
right? He was essentially like, this is not for you. You are not part of this. Uh, and she, she left crying, right? And then later on, Malcolm X participates in the Hajj, right? He visits Mecca. And when he's there, he has this incredibly life-changing experience of being around people from a variety of races and cultures and countries and the deep acceptance that they gave to him and the support, you know, and at one point he's living, somebody that's Muslim that realizes he's there for the Hajj takes him to his house and like gives him his bed and everything and says, here, stay in this, stay in my home. I'm going to go, I have other people I can go stay with. I want you to stay here while you're here as you know, participating in the Hajj. And it completely transformed his idea of what it meant to be part of something bigger than yourself. And he, I, he reflects on that late in the book. And he says that if he could go back to that diner when that woman came in, he would have given her a different answer. And so I think that's part of where I write from as well. You know, I recognize that there is a shared, there's a shared, there's a space in which we can share among different ethnic groups and represent each other and talk about each other's stories without there being any sense of exploitation or appropriation. And I think it really comes both from a place of authenticity, right? And not operating from a place of ignorance and also not, not operating from a place of appropriation, not, not trying to take some aspect of a culture and just use it as a decoration or something for your own personal gain or your own personal interest. And I think if you, if you take those things into consideration, uh, then art like mine, you know, that stretches identity boundaries as part of its, its expression. I think that there's a place for that to exist and to be a part of, of that Hodge feeling that Malcolm X had. And I think that's like, you know, I can, I can never figure out a way to really answer it perfectly. And maybe it's both things at once, you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but I know that I never, I wasn't able to, I don't think my fiction came alive until I started writing about Hawaii, when I, until I started writing about the islands. Uh, readers can find, can, should it go look at your novel, um, uh, Sharks in the Time of Saviors? We really enjoyed it. We enjoyed talking to you about it and Hawaii. And thank you for being on the show. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. We appreciate your making the time.